Hi guys. I welcome you all to this journey. Let's discuss about a rare epithelial disease that affects both genders equally, a vesiculobullous disease. It may happen in any age group, but the people most affected are in the middle ages like 40s to 50s. Some individuals may experience lesions on the whole body while in some the disease may remain confined to the oral cavity the first sign is oral vesicles which may ulcerate later on due to fragile oral mucosa these oral vesicles are called as the first to appear and last to go it may be rare but if left untreated may lead to death As oral vesicles is first sign of disease it brings a great deal of responsibility on the dentists for an early diagnosis before it's too late let's dig deeper the disease we were talking about is pemphigus vulgaris what is pemphigus vulgaris all about it is a rare autoimmune disease that is characterized by blisters erosions and ulcers on the skin and mucous membranes most commonly inside the mouth although rare but if not diagnosed or treated timely may be fatal due to excessive dehydration and electrolyte imbalance now let's see what causes pemphigus vulgaris The individual's own immune system starts reacting against its own tissues. Targets desmosomes which are special sticky spots which cement the keratinocytes together. Autoantibodies target proteins desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 which are components of desmosomes resulting in loss of cell to cell adherence intra epithelial split and intra epithelial blister formation let's view a few of the images of a patient with pemphigus vulgaris it can clearly be seen how the patient's eye floor of mouth buccal mucosa gingiva and palate have been affected at various sites the patient who may have presented with pain and on speaking eating or drinking when evaluated exhibits haphazard erosions and ulcerations along with a few intraoral blisters at various sites oral lesions may affect any location but the most commonly involved sites are buccal mucosa palate ventral tongue labial mucosa and the gingiva the clinician notes down a few of the many differentials based on the clinical outlook of the patient nikolsky test is performed to narrow down the differentials The test involves application of a firm and sustained lateral pressure on an unaffected site with either a finger or a blunt-ended instrument. Within a few seconds, a blister or an epithelial split is observed, which is a positive Nikolsky sign. This cuts down on a few of the DDs. while the clinician is left with pemphigus vulgaris mucous membrane pemphigoid and erosive lichen planus to rule out between now the definitive diagnostic test performs include perilesional biopsy for light microscopy and perilesional biopsy for direct immunofluorescence let's see a model this is an affected mucosa with a blister and an erosion visible A perilesional biopsy is intended which is which involves taking of a sample not from the lesion but from the surrounding tissue. 2 to 3 mm of distance must be kept between the lesion and the specimen site. 
the biopsy specimen is taken and placed in a specific container. Now similarly for the other side, same 2 to 3 mm of distance must be kept between the specimen site and the lien and then the biopsy specimen is placed in a specific container. To get familiar with how the disease happens, let's get a basic idea of how your normal oral epithelium appears. This is your oral epithelium with all its layers displayed, all resting on the basement membrane. Now a closer look shows you what keeps all these layers held together tightly. On a closer look, we see the cell-to-cell -cell junctions also known as the desmosomes, the special sticky spots which cement the keratinocytes together and are present throughout the oral epithelium. Now for an affected individual, auto circulating autoantibodies of type IgG and C3 have attached themselves to desmoglein 3 of the desmosomes resulting in acantholysis, which is breakdown of cell-to-cell -cell contact and formation of freely floating cells, which are the acantholytic cells. Let's see how the epithelium for a patient with pemphigus vulgaris would look like. The IgG-affected keratinocytes have started losing cell-to-cell -cell contact. As the contacts break, fluid accumulates in the free space that is suprabasilar resulting in formation of intraepithelial blister. The intraepithelial or a suprabasilar split. Why is it called as a suprabasilar split? Basal cells remain seated at the basement membrane due to absence of desmosomes at the base. The presence of hemidesmosomes at the base holds basal cells tightly to the basement membrane. Thus, the intraepithelial split is suprabasilar in nature. Secondly, you will see formation of acantholytic cells. The cells that lose contact, lose their morphology, become hyperchromatic, small and rounded. They are also called as the Zank cells. Let's see how the microscopic slides would appear. This shows the intraepithelial suprabasilar cleft which is filled with blister fluid. The cleft is just above the basal cell layer. Now what you see is a tombstone appearance of the basal cell layer. Sometimes the entire superficial layer of epithelium is stripped away, leaving only a layer of basal cells which is described as resembling a row of tombstones, which is due to the hemidesmosomal contact of basal cells to the basement membrane which keeps them seated. Thirdly, what you'll see are Zank cells. The cells of spinous layer that have lost contact occur singly or in the form of clumps lie in the blister fluid. These cells lose their morphology, become small, rounded, containing hyperchromatic nuclei. Direct immunofluorescence. frozen section of human biopsy specimen with autoantibodies attached to the cells is flushed with fluorescein labeled anti-human IgG. This is viewed for pemphigus vulgaris, which is a characteristic fishnet pattern. Let's see with the help of a model. This is the fishnet and this black line represents the intact and unaffected basal cell layer. 
If one square represent a keratinocyte of the spinous cellular and the line represents a desmosome or a desmoglein 3 then each cell is attached to the neighboring cell on all sides with desmosomes the affected individual has autoantibodies attached to the desmosomes or the desmoglein 3 of desmosomes when the specimen is flushed with fluorescein labeled anti-human IgG, it forms a complex and gives the characteristic fishnet pattern. This is how the fishnet for Pempigus vulgaris appears. Now coming towards the treatment. The primary aim of treatment is to decrease new blister formations, prevent any sort of secondary infection and to promote healing of ulcers and vesicles. For an initial management, an intermediate dose of corticosteroids prednisone is given. For severely affected individuals, high dose of systemic corticosteroids along with non-steroidal immunosuppressive agents like azathioprine, dapsone, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate is also used. Now for various treatment options, we have a combined drug regimen with an alternate rate prednisone plus a steroid sparing immunosuppressant agent. Second method is topical along with systemic steroid therapy which helps to lower the dose of systemic steroids. Thirdly, for the unresponsive refractory cases, a targeted therapy of rituximab, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody is being used. An appropriate wound care, a good oral hygiene maintenance with the help of mouth washes like chlorhexidine, minimizing activities that may traumatize skin and mucous membranes that includes sports activities and eating and drinking of spicy, acidic or hard and crunchy foods must be avoided and follow-up schedules must be strictly followed. Ending with the hope that it helped you in one way or the other.